All right. Um, we ready to go soon? Yes, perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, the talk today is coping, thriving, and supporting parenting children with additional needs during a pandemic or any time. And um, uh, I'm Tom Frazier, and my wife Allison Frazier is also here. Uh, we're going to do this talk together uh, in two parts. I'm going to do the first part, and uh, Allison, because she knows a lot more useful information I do about uh, most of this stuff, uh, is going to do a big uh, chunk of the second part. Um, a uh, couple quick things on my end. One is um, I'm going to get through my section fairly quickly because a lot of it is fairly obvious stuff. Although as I was putting together the presentation, I was like, oh yeah, that's obvious, but I'm not doing it. Um, oh yeah, that's obvious, but I'm not doing it. So um, a lot of it is just going to be reminders about the things that we should be trying to do for ourselves and for the people we care about. Um, and then Allison um, will get into more specific stuff. So the outline is just, uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about basic mental and physical health protection and maintenance. And then um, we'll talk about parent child and parent parent relationships and how do we keep those going in a positive direction. And then Allison's going to get into positive behavioral strategies and, and then recuperating from COVID learning loss. So, um, and part, not all of our talk, but part of our talk is very well covered on a really nice uh, blog post, I guess it'd be called a blog post. And the link for that is at the bottom of the screen here. Um, so we would both encourage you to go to that link um, and read that because it's, it'll be uh, overlapping with what we talk about today, but it'll be a good thing to hang on to for future reference. Um, uh, just in terms of basic physical health, I mean, no, like I said, nothing I'm going to say is going to be groundbreaking or earth shattering, but um, uh, uh, you know, we have to keep to a routine. Uh, a lot of times we think of a routine as really important for our, our loved one, our child, um, but it's actually really important for us too, because it allows us to minimize our stress. You know, one of the most stressful things in the world is actually just a total change in your routine. So um, keeping a routine is, is hugely important. And when you get out of the routine, getting back quickly, even if, it, even if you just have to take small steps to get back to the routine. Um, so, you know, for me, I noticed that Monday through Friday, it's not unusual at all that my routine gets messed up because of work obligations. And so if I can just remember to take a walk, uh, just carve out, you know, 20 minutes uh, for Allison, I think it's a lot of times it's doing yoga um, uh, and, or meditating or relaxing. I, I have a friend who uh, works in a really stressful hospital environment and, you know, that person will literally just take 10 minutes a, at lunch and do meditation and relaxation and it makes a big difference for them. So it doesn't need to be really long or really involved. It actually just needs to be something that you commit to. Um, uh, some of the folks that are really good at meditation, like John Kabat-Zinn, um, uh, will tell you, for example, that, um, you know, when you start out with meditation, you can set a goal for yourself, but if you just do two minutes, that's good. Just do two minutes. Um, so, you know, you don't have to feel bad if you're not doing a 35 minute meditation, you know, just do it, do what you can. And then, the, the hardest thing for me to remember is that eating is even more important than exercise. And um, I don't know if you guys have followed the statistics on this, but it, it turns out that the pandemic is probably going to cause double digit average weight gain, at least in some populations. So, um, you know, <laughs> I, I read a statistic that in some younger adults that we're seeing maybe as much as 20 pounds of weight gain uh, throughout the pandemic. So, this is really not a good thing, obviously. And um, if you can't exercise at all, I would just encourage people not to eat after eight o'clock at night. That's probably the simplest thing you can do. And then, um, you know, if it's if it's comfortable for you and you've talked to your doctor, then consider things like intermittent fasting as well. It turns out that intermittent fasting is going to have some really good benefits for our immune systems, um, most likely. In terms of basic mental health, um, uh, I already talked about keeping a schedule. So obviously that's important for physical health. It's also important for mental health. 
Um, I would just say, think about mental health schedules on a weekly basis um, as well as a daily basis because you have to build in leisure time and we can't do leisure time necessarily every day. Um, if you can, that's great, obviously. Um, it's very common for families that I've worked with that have developmental disabilities, autism, ADHD, where they, they feel like the only leisure time they get is just after bed, uh, is just after their children go to sleep. And if you're like uh, Allison and I, our son is 17 now, so he may not even go to sleep at, <laughs> uh, before we go to sleep. Uh, so you don't even get that leisure time anymore. Uh, so I would just encourage people to, to build in leisure time, not just after bedtime, but find parts during the day where you can either relieve each other if you're, if you're co-parenting or whatever the arrangement is, find a way to um, get some time. Um, and then I would also just say, call out your negative patterns and commit to changes to interrupt the pattern. So for example, one common pattern that I'm stuck in and that I have a lot of trouble with is by the end of the work week, I feel exhausted. Like I can't really give much else. And, um, you know, it's important to look at why we end up in these patterns. Um, is it because I didn't exercise? Is it because I lost sleep the last three days? Is it because I'm frustrated about what's going on at work? Am I letting things build up? Um, you now, if things are building up, for example, a lot of times it's just a matter of talking it out, letting it, letting it out, maybe writing, writing it out. I know people that journal, for example, um, that that's really helpful for them because it allows them to drop whatever it is they're thinking about. Um, I have a, something that's both a good, bad habit and a good habit. The, the, the good part of the habit is I keep my phone near my bed and the reason why that I, can, I call that sort of a good habit is because if I have something that comes into my mind about research or about um, teaching or something that I'm thinking about that I'm really ruminating about, I'll pick up the phone really quick, write it in the phone, and then put the phone back down. So it's a bad habit because you shouldn't really keep your phone near you at bedtime. But uh, it's a good habit for me because once I write it down, I don't have to think about it anymore. And that allows me to calm down and get ready for bed. Um, so... Um, I would just also say that mental health is a team game. Um, you know, if we feel supported, we're going to do better. If we don't feel supported, there's basically two different ways you can support people in your life. There's physical ways like making dinner or going out and buying dinner or um, uh, taking out, you know, taking charge of some of the household chores. And then there's the emotional support way. And there's, you know, asking people how they're doing talking to people about their day, um, trying to problem solve with folks if that's what they want to do. If they don't want to problem solve and they just want to vent, then just allowing them to vent. Um, so, you know, that's the, the physical, some of us are better at one or than the other. And, uh, you know, it's important for us to, unfortunately that doesn't always match what our significant other, our spouse needs. And so um, if, if you can figure that out and really, you know, try to fill the gap better. So, you know, I tend to be better at emotional support than physical support. So sometimes there's times when Allison's just like, hey, I need you to take out the garbage or I need you to do these things. And, you know, trying to do it without requesting is also a big skill. Um, I'm not very good at that, but um, as Allison will attest, but if you can get into the habit of doing a certain number of things that are not necessarily in your wheelhouse, then that can provide a lot of the kind of support that your significant other, your spouse needs. Um, I'm really big on just inquiring, you know, asking what's going on, um, and then trying to listen without judgment or fixing. For men, for, for us, it's really hard not to get into the sort of problem solving and fixing mode. You know, you should do that, don't do that. You know, giving advice is very common. Um, I would just encourage people, it, it, a lot of times it's not about fixing it. It's just about listening. So um, try to avoid the fixing part unless the person explicitly asks you to, um, to problem solve. And a lot of times it's not clear. So one of the things you want to do if you can is develop a common language. So like, um, is this something you want me to problem solve on? Or is this something you just want to tell me about? Um, uh, and then the break pass idea, you know, uh, I'm giving you a two hour break today, or it doesn't have to be that formal. It can just be a matter of like what something Allison and I do for each other with our son, Sean is, um, I'll just say, Hey, I'm taking Sean for a long walk or Allison will say, I'm taking Sean for a drive. 
Well, that's just like a break pass, right? It's, it's, it's a way for me to say, oh, okay, now I can do things I need to do or things that I want to do for a period of time or vice versa. Um, by the way, I'll stop for a second. Um, I know I go quickly because I want to get to Allison's part, which I think is going to be uh, really hands-on and, and important for you guys to hear, but do stop us along the way if there's questions or uh, things. Uh, you don't necessarily have to hold everything to the end. My general rule is clarifying questions are perfectly fine during the talk. Um, but if you guys um, you know, have something that you're really curious about, let us know. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, a lot of times we like to look forward to big things, uh, but there's actually research that shows that, yeah, we do look forward to vacations. It turns out that a lot of the mental health benefit to vacations occurs before you take the vacation. It's actually in the preparation. It's in the looking forward to the vacation. So a lot of times we have that backwards. We think it's the vacation that actually helps us. It's turns out that it, it's actually the looking forward to the vacation. But also what the research shows us is it's the small stuff we do on a weekly basis that helps us to sustain and really maintain our quality of life and our mental health. So, you know, from our world, the things that we do that sustain that or have through the years anyway is, you know, we used to have a habit of doing popcorn at night where you know, uh, our son really liked popcorn. And so he kind of <laughs> insisted on it, but we would make popcorn. And then that was something that we could do together when the kids were younger. Now that they're older, we don't do it as much, but we do do a lot of walks in the park or the neighborhood. And uh, we'll also do trips in the summertime in particular to Dairy Queen for shakes um, or other treats. Um, so these are things that we do regularly. We got so regular at Dairy Queen that they gave us like a special card at one point where they were like, <laughs> Um, you know, letting us get like a free shake every five times we were there, which was like every five days. So it was like we were getting free shakes one or two times a week usually. Um, but anyway, uh, it's a cool, um, it was a cool thing for us to do and it really sustains us, um, uh, our mental health. And, uh, you know, in terms of the parent-child relationship, I like to tell people that a lot of times as parents, we think of ourselves as like, did I say the right thing or did I do the right thing? And, and of course, that's important. Obviously, I'm not going to say that's not important. But the other thing that to really consider, especially when your kids are younger, before they really get it, you know, fully into their teens, which makes things harder. But um, and I say that as the father of a 16 year old daughter right now, um, before they get into their teens, it's really important. Are they reinforced by your presence? Right. Like. It, do they like being around you? Because if, if, you, if you're too heavy handed or you give too many directives or you, you, know, you, you don't really do a good job of mixing in reinforcement versus punishment, then they're not gonna be reinforced by your presence. And so, and you can see it in kids fairly quickly, right? Like they, they'll actually physically distance themselves. Um, now this is different in teenagers. My daughter could care less if I'm around. That's fine. That's a part of natural developmental growth. But for young kids, it's really important to maintain that reinforcement um, uh, and make sure that they really do are reinforced by your presence. Um, as I said, in teenagers, you can limit your assistance to really specific situations. I found with my daughter that if I have one really, really strong conversation with her a month, then that's awesome. And that's what she wants from me. And so that's what I need to provide. And I really need to see that as a win. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't need to be over involved in her life, um, but I do need to sort of actively promote, um, look for ways to promote independence. And this is especially true when you have teenagers with developmental disabilities, because, um, you know, it's very obvious and we, we get into this habit of sort of taking over their lives and structuring their lives in certain ways. And so we have to look for active ways to promote independence. When I ran the social spies program, one of the things we would do, which would really freak out the parents before we started the program, it was a year long program where we would do 20 sessions of training for the parent and the child. And then in the summer, they would go to summer camp. And one of the things that we would do that would really freak out the parents at the beginning of the year is we would say, so in the summer, when your child is going to camp, they're going to stay overnight. There are three overnights and they have to do at least one of the three overnights. And you would see the looks on some of the parents' faces that were just like, no way. Like, no, this is not happening. 
but we had it as a rule uh, that you know each child that came into the program had to do at least one overnight and what you would see what would happen with the kids was well first of all the kids really liked the vast majority of the children like loved it okay um the parents would fret and really like you would see almost them as we got closer and closer to the time the parents would get more and more stressed out but then what would happen is you you know 99 of the time this went really well and the parent was like almost you could see it in their face like they were almost like bewildered and shocked by it like they just couldn't believe that this went well right like it was it was to the point where some parents would be like I don't even know how that happened like I, I have no idea how this just occurred so you know we have to look for ways to promote independence maybe it doesn't have to be overnight so I'm just using that as an example but it's something to to consider and then the last slide for me that I want to cover I think the last slide, maybe second last is um the parent parent relationship you know and this is all obvious stuff but just not taking time and making effort is the number one problem um everything everything that we do here helps and we have to build positive momentum so it's really about trying to get that respite and then using the respite in a way that builds the relationship i don't need to tell everybody how to do that for yourself but i just Think that that's such an important thing that we can't lose and in the pandemic it's definitely getting lost uh, for a lot of people so i'll turn it over to allison now a second um so it, we talked a lot about structure for parents and i'm going to talk a lot about structure and routine for the children um, that you're supporting in home so you know it provides a sense of control for kids when they know what to expect and um, that they have a routine that they can rely on um, reduces their frustration and um, you know lessens their problem solving overload so one of the things we're going to talk about quite a bit is how um, children that we are supporting at home have a lot of executive functioning or organizational issues that is making this whole pandemic uh, so much more difficult for them. So they were used to, you know, getting up, uh, you know, getting a ride to school, uh, going into a school building, having education structured in that way. And they probably had a pretty set routine in the evening as well. And now the pandemic has just thrown everything off. They're either getting all of their school at home or they're getting school in a different way where they, um, you know, recess and gym class and specials and all of those things look different. And then their home routine is going to look a lot different too, because there's not, um, you know, the same routine. There's not the the birthday parties and all the things that maybe they have become accustomed to. So if we can kind of create a new routine, um, you know, it's going to help them uh, struggle a little less. So one of the first things I'm going to talk about is the things that we can control. So, or to help, you know, control. So we can't control the inside brain distractions. So that might be, you know, repetitive thoughts that um, your child is having, um, their worries, uh, whether they're hungry or tired or, or sick, like we can't control any of that. We can only control the outside, the brain distractions. So um, when we think about our child doing schoolwork, at home, you know, think about the sensitivities to sounds um, that could be, uh, you know, other kids uh, screaming and, and playing in the background. It could be smells. It could be visual distractions, such as too much stuff on the table around them. Um, it could be the dogs that want to play and are sniffing them. It could be their phones next to them with text messages coming in if they're older or, you um, it could be the TV in the background. There's a really interesting program that's on video games, like whatever those outside distractions are, we can take control of that. And, um, you know, we can organize the environment to eliminate distractions. So I'm going to show you some pictures of an organized entryway, homework station, and uh, caddies. So this is not a picture of our entryway because we are not blessed with an entryway this large, but um, if you are, uh, you see that this is just a place for if your kid is going to school every day, they come home and they have a place to put their stuff. Because one of the biggest complaints I often hear from parents is that my kid's stuff is everywhere. Like they can't find their books, they can't find their folders, they can't find their shoes. Um, but if you have sort of an organized place that when I come home, I hang my backpack here, I put my shoes here, my car keys, like, you know, if they're teenagers, whatever it is, um, 
if they can organize their life in that way, that can really reduce stress for both them and you. This is just showing a little uh, homework station. Um, what I like about this station is that it's low cost and simple. That's just a basic curtain rod that they hung some buckets on to organize their markers and crayons and pencils. And I like the seat back organizers because that keeps um, all of their homework materials that they might need really handy. Um, another thing that, a couple other things that I like about this is that it's not isolated. So the kids aren't, you know, relegated to the, their bedroom or a basement or something like that where they feel like that homework or school time is almost a punishment. They get to be in the central part of the house, but it seems like it's a, a more quiet, distraction-free area of the house. So, um, you know, hopefully it's not in front of a television or, uh, you know, something like that. This is a homework caddy. So this, uh, <laughs> this was an amazing idea that was given to me when my daughter um, was still really young and I was still supporting her with homework. Um, she was master at breaking her pencils or losing her scissors or can't find the note cards or whatever. Um, really great excuse making techniques for why she couldn't sit and focus on her homework. So this was just a basic, you know, like bath caddy and just filled it with tons of sharpened pencils and all the supplies. And it really took a lot of stress out of homework time for us. I also like that the bathroom caddy is portable, so it could be transported to different areas. So we always did uh, homework at the kitchen table, but you know, sometimes it just couldn't be in that spot for whatever reason. Um, and so we had to move to the, to the dining room or somewhere else in the house and that caddy was portable. Um, this one is available at Michael's. Um, this is a, a larger rolling caddy that you can keep all of the schoolwork and homework stuff together. Um, it really does make an enormous difference just to have all of the homework supplies in one spot because we know that our, um, our kids with disabilities aren't great at organizing themselves and keeping up with their stuff. So we can just provide these simple little environmental modifications that can make a big difference. Um, so just think about and start to visualize your child doing their schoolwork or homework and either write down or just prepare a mental list of all the steps needed for your child to successfully complete an assignment. So if your uh, child is like most individuals with um, developmental challenges, um, then they probably would have a hard time generating the list you just made. And they would most likely struggle with implementing independently all of these steps. And they may find it challenging to figure out how long it will take to complete the routine. So I commonly will ask uh, the students that I work with, you know, how long do you think it's going to take you to do your homework tonight? And, uh, you know, one of two estimates I will get that are really off base. I'll get, oh, I'll get it done in five minutes or it's going to take me five hours to do it. Um, so that time prediction is a skill that we get better and better at as we get older and, you know, oftentimes the kids that I work with don't have that skill at all. And so we can start developing that skill and we'll talk about that, how to do that a little bit better. Um, and does your child understand the social implications of her procrastination, his or her procrastination, or um, you know, maybe the behavioral challenges that they're bringing to the home environment uh, with procrastinating their work? So if you answered yes to these questions, you're not alone and there are strategies that can help. Uh, so we'll talk about how to temporarily define, use checklists, use visual cues, prioritize, and teach social impact. So, you know, everything in our day has a time limit. Um, the time timer, so that's the uh, little iPhone timer that I have shown down in the bottom left of the screen. Um, that is incredibly helpful for helping kids learn and predict the movement of time. So the nice thing about the time timer is actually visually showing time clicking away. And so now I don't advise that you, you know, put a time timer in front of the kid and say, you've got 
you know, 10 minutes to do your homework and the timer's gonna be timing you on it because that's a lot of pressure. Um, but you can time other things like their breaks. So, uh, you know, if you're embedding breaks into their homework time, you can say, okay, now here you've got a 10 minute break, 10 minutes, you can do whatever you want and they can start to watch uh, the time click away. Um, older students can uh, use iPo iPods, iPhones, um, iPad apps and things like that to help uh, predict the movement of time. Um, but so, you know, I would ask my student up front to predict how long is this assignment going to take, you know, and I might get the five minutes or I might get the five hours. And then, you know, I record how long it takes them to do it. And then I report that to them later. So this actually took you 15 minutes. So you thought it was going to take five hours and it took 15 minutes when you focused on it. Um, you know, great work, but also like teaching them to start to predict how long um, tasks will take. This is a picture of a time timer, um, the old fashioned kind um, that you can purchase that can be really helpful for, uh, for temporally defining and understanding time. Um, checklists can be used to break down the tasks into um, the smallest unit necessary in order to be successful. So uh, we use this as behavior analysts a lot. We call it task analysis. That's our fancy name for it. But um, basically, when you were thinking before about the steps that it would take your child to complete their schoolwork, you were creating a task analysis. Um, so the way that we as behavior analysts do it is we think about it and we write down everything we can think about and then we do it. And then we write down all the steps that we did and then we break it down. Then we watch the kid do it and we see where the breakdown happened. So if it was, for example, coming home and unpacking your backpack and putting your shoes away, um, we look to see what the skills the kid already had and you know where was the breakdown, where were the skills that they didn't have and then we intervene um, only where needed. But we have to break down skills into small steps so that kids can uh, be successful um, in completing them because that executive functioning isn't uh, happening naturally. Um, and it's just, it's, it's not great in any kid, but especially kids with uh, developmental challenges, um, they're having a hard time making that list and breaking things down. And anytime you can make something visual for a child, um, it can be incredibly beneficial. So expecting them to, to generate lists in their head and remember that list and do things step by step and doing that all mentally is not necessarily um, a reasonable expectation. So it doesn't mean that they will use all of these visual supports forever. Um, they can be faded with time, but the more things that you can put in front of your child with visual supports, um, the better that they are going to do and the more independent they're going to become. Um, so these visual cues are, um, this one is a macro schedule. So this is showing what the child can expect Monday through Saturday or Monday, through, I can't see the bottom of it, I forget. Um, but it's just showing like on Monday, you've got homework, sports, and it's your chore to set the table. On Tuesday, you've got homework, music, and it's your chore to feed the pets. So that's just providing um, a, a macro or weekly schedule. And then micro is when you take the individual item off the list and break it down even smaller. So you could take the individual uh, items such as setting the table and then you could break that down into visual or um, steps to help the child complete that task. So I'm gonna show you how that visuals can get progressively more complex. So this is a very simple visual, um, just showing, I think this afternoon I will, and then it's all visual. So this would be um, potentially for a non-reader. Um, this would be a homework log that was spread uh, separated down by the week, just showing the assignments that are needed. I love when teachers use this kind of homework chart because it gives the student a lot of freedom of what they want to choose. So this could be um, a weekly or monthly homework chart and the kid just has to do all the things on it and cross it off as it's done. Um, I know you're not the one creating the, the homework or the assignments, but you could think about this and how you could use it as like a chore chart, for example. So if you set up that you wanted your child to do, um, you know, nine chores over the course of the week or the month, and you let them have the independence to choose what they wanted to do and cross it off, then you're promoting a little bit of independence while also providing those visual supports for them. Um, this is a very low tech um, 
visual support that helps a lot of kids and it's just taking a file folder and cutting it into pieces. So the worksheets can sometimes be really overwhelming and a kid looks at it and they think, oh my gosh, I can't do this, this is too much. But just by simply being able to flip over pieces of the file folder and breaking a big worksheet down into smaller pieces can do miracles for some kids. Um, this is getting a little more complex. So a kid who has multiple subjects and color coding can be really helpful um, so that they know, like I put all my math stuff in the red folder and all of my language arts stuff in the purple folder. Um, and we do that ourselves, right? So we have all of our computer file folders and sometimes I color code my <laughs> computer file folders because it helps me to have quicker access. Um, so this isn't, you know, permanent. Like I said, these are steps towards, you know, ultimate independence. And then as the kid gets older, they need to learn how to use their calendars. Um, I could not function at all without um, my calendar and I color code my calendars. And, um, you know, that's the ultimate goal, goal to teach the kid to get to that point. So um, another uh, skill that is often difficult for our kids is prioritizing. So what is most important and what should be done first? So as we look at expectations by age, when we are helping our child prioritize their homework or their schoolwork in the primary grades, so meaning like K1 and 2, um, plans should be made by the parent or guardian with the child's participation. So they're not capable at that point of prioritizing. And the lower intermediate grades, so meaning like three, four, five, maybe six, uh, the planning should be done by the kids with the parent or guardian support. And then in the upper intermediate and secondary grades, so looking at you know seven, eight um, through high school, um, you know a, a reasonable expectation should might be depending on your child's you know individual developmental level, but it might be that planning and implementing um, are independent and parent only does check-ins as needed. But you have to, the, the idea here is it's scaffolding, right? So you're starting with the most intervention when they're younger or based on their developmental level. So it's not always by age, it's you know, more by their developmental level. You're providing the most support and then you're slowly fading your support with time so that they're working towards independence. Um, this is just a homework chart that I made. I actually made this for a fifth grade student. Um, and I just, in a box at the top, I said, what supplies do I need to gather to get started? It was temporally defining um, how long will this take? So the kid estimates how long he's gonna need to complete his three homework tasks. And then the total time he would need to set aside to do his homework. Then the prioritizing, what should he do first, second and third? And uh, helping him determine if he needed help, right? Do I need help in these tasks or these tasks that I can do by myself? And then, um, I put this top sign at the end for this particular kid because he needed a review, a quick review at the end. Um, are all my tasks done? Did I put it away? Did an adult check it? Did I put it in my folder? Because that is oftentimes a problem I would experience with some of the children I worked with that they would do the work and then leave it on their um, desk table. So did I put it in my folder? Yes, I completed everything. Homework is done. Now it's reward time. Um, and it's okay to teach the social impact. Um, you know, depending on your particular uh, learner, if they um, are in some sort of social skills instruction, um, they should also be taught the impact of their homework or schoolwork behavior, right? So um, you can clearly discuss your feelings about how their procrastination or how their um, maybe, you know, extreme avoidance or, um, you know, drama around school and homework is impacting their relationships with their teachers, um, you as their parent, with their siblings. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a punitive conversation, but, you know, perhaps just an awareness conversation, because if you have a learner um, with autism, for example, they just may not understand uh, the social impact that they're having, and, and it's okay to have an awareness conversation. If you have a learner with ADHD, it may not be that they have a brain difference that helps them not be able to perspective take, um, but they might struggle a little bit with the social skills because they're not socially attending to the right information. They're not looking at your face and they're not understanding how um, frustrating that their behavior is for you. I think that this is the area that we struggle with the most in our family is 
the social impact that, and, and I have, uh, my younger son has um, ADHD and my daughter has, my older daughter has autism and they just, we talk about it almost every day and I just don't know how to get them to listen, <laughs> believe me, like we're doing homework for three hours and it's only 15 minutes worth. Um, I just, I, I'm having a hard time. Like if I'm not physically sitting there while they're doing homework, they're gonna goof off. My son will goof off on the computer and my daughter will find it read. And it's like every day after school, I come home from work, I'm doing three, four hours of homework with my kids and it's, it's exhausting. Right. Yeah. So have you had the social conversation with them of, you know, if we were able to get this done much faster, I would feel X, you would feel X, you know, we would have time for Y. Have you, have you explicitly had these conversations? We have, I, I, we, I don't think we've used the if then language though. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something I can kind of throw into the mix. Yeah, and I'm happy to send you if you'd like some social behavior maps. Um, sometimes yes. those are really helpful because, you know, we've been talking this whole time about how visual um, our learners are, and I have social maps that we can kind of map it out for them. Because um, sometimes just hearing it isn't quite as effective as like seeing it on a social map of this was your behavior and this is how this made me feel and this is a different choice you could have made and this would be the alternate outcome which could have resulted in. Um, more comfortable feelings for everyone in the family, but also just more opportunities for good times and fun, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be very helpful. Sure. Um, so, right. you know, that, that, that was the... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna add to, this may not be relevant to your situation, Robin, but what I've seen in some of these situations is that your presence is rewarding and reinforcing. And so, there are some times when the parent being present for the homework is a self-reinforcing process where the child really likes that. And so it does take longer because they enjoy that sort of, I know it sounds weird because sometimes it can be a negative interaction, but they actually get reinforced by that interaction. And so you have to be really careful too. I mean, obviously what, what Allison said is really useful, but I also just would encourage people to be careful, understand, are you inadvertently reinforcing the length of time through the relationship? You know, that's the trick of all of this is there's no, if there was one solution, we wouldn't be doing this talk, right? Like there just wouldn't, we, there would be no need for it. We'd all know the solution. We'd all implement it. There would be no need for the talk. The key is evaluating sort of what are the causative factors and that's tricky you know that's where it becomes really hard to figure out and you need sort of another set of eyes in any given situation sorry for no that makes sense um so the next thing i'm going to talk about is a couple of behavior strategies that you can use because you know mostly this was all just executive functioning how do i provide visuals how do i organize but if your child just loathes schoolwork, or as Tom pointed out, maybe they're really enjoying um, mom time, so they're being um, reinforced by the attention that they get, um, you know, how can we put in a behavior system? So there's lots of behavior systems. I'm just gonna focus on two. Um, one is a token economy and one is a behavior contract. So token economies are better with younger learners and they have real life carryover. And a behavior contract is better for a mature learner and promotes independence. So in an individual token economy, this diagram is just showing how, you know, it relates to real life. So sometimes people are really resistant, like I don't want to give my kid tokens, like this is bizarre, this is weird. Um, but it's actually, you know, in real life, we complete a job task, we earn money and we trade our money for tangible things that we want. So um, in, a, in a token economy for our child, they go to school, they complete, uh, whether that's home or physical school, they complete their academic tasks, earn tokens, and trade in those tokens for um, activities, games, trips, suites, uh, whatever they are motivated by. So there are three components to a token economy, a list of behaviors and expectations. So I usually tell parents to focus on no more than three behaviors at a time. 
and that could uh, that could be like homework completion. It could be completing homework without complaining. It could be um, you know effectively turning off your electronic distractions during homework. Like whatever it needs to be in your family. But I I like to focus on one easy. Uh, task because we want them to be earning some tokens. So one thing that's easier for them to learn, um, one thing that is more difficult for them to learn. And uh, with this, my learners with uh, autism or ADHD, I always throw in something social as well. So I want them to, um, you know, develop their social skills in, in some way. So component one is your list of behaviors. Uh, component two is tokens or points that are earned for doing the behavior. And component three is the list of items, activities, or privileges to be exchanged for the tokens. So obviously some things are gonna be worth more than others. So, um, you know, maybe 15 minutes of watching your favorite program is not worth nearly as much as uh, Chuck E. Cheese uh, outing for the whole family, for example. So you wanna kind of determine um, what is actually motivating your child and then how uh, how valuable are these items? And it doesn't have to be based on actual money. It's just based on what your kid actually values. And these are the components of a token economy. So uh, the tokens, they could be plastic chips, stickers, tickets, points on an app, um, the target behaviors, the rewards, uh, the ratio of exchange. So we talked about a little bit um, that some items will be worth more than others rules of how and when the tokens can be earned and exchanged. So I've seen a lot of token economies fall apart because um, the kid got to their magic number of 15 tokens and 15 tokens was how many they needed for Chuck E. Cheese. And they said, let's go Chuck E. Cheese right now. And it's three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. And the mom's like, no, dude, we're not going to Chuck E. Cheese right now. Um, and then the kid's like, that's it, forget it. Um, you know, this token economy is bogus. I'm not doing this anymore. But if you establish the rules up front, like tokens can be turned in on Friday night or Saturday afternoon so that you're prepared and ready um, if there's outings and things like that in your token economy that you're not caught off guard and the kid doesn't see you as, um, as a liar, right? And then costs, determine if response costs will be used. So, uh, if there's response costs, that means that the, you can define certain behaviors, like, for example, lying, cheating, stealing, you know, whatever it is in your family, um, aggression, anything like that, that would uh, result in a token loss, that's fine. You just need to establish it up front. So you don't want to be in the situation where the child is earning tokens and, you know, they dropped an F-bomb or punched their brother and you said, that's it, give me 10 tokens, but that was never established up front. Um, and, you know, some behaviors can cost more than others. So the two behaviors I just mentioned, they might be worth a lot of tokens, right? But, uh, you know, maybe getting busted for, um, you know, playing Xbox during homework time, maybe that's not worth, you know, a lot of token loss. Maybe that's only one token loss. And make sure your child doesn't go into the negative. Um, never have, if you put token loss in, never have a kid at negative five and then they're earning their way out of the hole. Does not work. Um, and ensure that your child always has a way to earn the tokens back. And what if the child doesn't meet the requirements? You know, you don't need to nag and, uh, you know, have a long discussion about it. Just matter of fact approach. You didn't earn enough tokens for your award. Let's try again next time. Uh, here's a simple token economy I'm working for. And then the uh, 12 tokens in this instance that were needed to earn that reward. Oh man, the slide didn't come through. Um, but this, if the slide had come through appropriately, this would just show that one token was worth um, uh, a cookie and then maybe, you know, six tokens were worth, uh, you know, something more uh, like 15 minutes of video games or something like that. So Older kids don't really want a token economy. Um, so if you're talking about high school students or a more advanced learner, you might want to look at something like a contingency contract to use with them instead. Um, there's just simply three parts to a contingency contract, a description of the task, a description of the reward, and a task record. Um, so the child should be actively involved in creating the contract. So the, the contract could be something like I will um, get myself up in time for school, um, 
eat breakfast and be standing at the bus stop by you know 7 35. and then the record would be you know you have a visual showing that they did it on monday tuesday didn't make it on wednesday did it on thursday did it on friday um, and then you want to make sure that the contract is followed exactly with no extra behavioral contingencies being added so similarly to i said don't randomly take tokens away from your child don't randomly add things to the contract so if the contract was simply about getting on the bus on time if your child you know I'm, i'll say drop the f-bomb again that doesn't mean that their contract is blown you can develop a new different contract for that behavior later if you want but if the contract was purely about the bus then stick to the bus and make sure that you actually have access to the reward um, this is just uh, a contract for that kid who gets ready for school every morning by 7.45. He gets a check mark in the box for every day that he did it. And then uh, mom and dad have agreed they will take him to Chuck E. Cheese on um, Friday night. And this one's very specific, but specifies exactly how many tokens he can earn at Chuck E. Cheese and, and all of that stuff. So is there an app for this stuff? So I've talked a lot about visuals. Yes, there is an app for everything. You don't have to be creating visuals and laminating things in your house. Um, you can find resource guides of where to find a lot of these items. Autism Speaks has a great resource guide. Um, the ARC has a tech toolbox, so you can go online. Um, and if you wanna try these things out before you invest in them, there are two great resources um, in the city for lending libraries. So the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities has an amazing lending library, so they can lend almost anything. So you could try out um, vibrating pillows or weighted blankets or all kinds of things like that, but they also can load the software onto your device. So your iPad or your um, iPhone. Um, the way that it works with the DD is that they will, due to COVID right now, they'll meet you in your driveway and they will um, download the app that you wanna try out onto your device. If you love it and it's a great app that's working for your kid, um, if you have access to funds like the uh, family resources dollars or um, a waiver or anything like that, then you can use that funding um, to purchase the app permanently. Um, the Ohio Center uh, for Autism and Low Instance Disabilities, also Ocali, uh, they have a great lending library as well. I've never actually used their lending library, so I'm not as familiar with how it works, but I have used the, um, the DD li lending library quite a bit and it's super convenient. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to touch on really quickly is uh, recuperating from COVID learning loss. So our kids have really suffered this year. They have lost a lot of the interventions that they needed, a lot of the speech therapy, the occupational therapy, um, physical therapy, behavior therapy, all of that stuff has been um, lost. And there's two ways that schools can recuperate. They can provide compensatory education or extended school year services. You're not gonna automatically qualify for these services. A lot of this is um, hard work and documentation on the parents end, um, documenting like my, my child's IEP says in the services section, they are entitled to an hour of speech a week. And you go back and look at the 12 weeks of school that were missed, and that means 12 hours of speech, for example, that was missed. Um, you know, you need to document that, but you also need to show that your child didn't make as much progress as you would expect. So a well-written IEP means that at the end of that IEP year, the child should have mastered their goal. And if your progress reports show that your child didn't make a lot of progress, for example, then those two pieces together are evidence that your child needs compensatory education. Um, compensatory education is not always an hour for hour match, um, unfortunately. Um, so if your kid missed 12 hours of speech, you know, they'll try to offer you as little as possible and you as the parent are pushing back for as much as possible, right? But your child is entitled to the 12 hours missed. Extended school year, same sort of thing. Um, in Ohio, so there's actually 12 different standards that the feds put out for what qualifies a kid for ESY. Um, in Ohio, uh, they're really focused on um, learning loss. Right, so um, the way that they oftentimes determine if the child qualifies for ESY is they look at 
where their progress was before the break and where the progress was after the break. And if there was um, a loss in progress, then they qualify for extended school year. And uh, Ohio schools like to stick really hard to that criteria only. Um, but I have seen lots of families be able um, to win even if their child didn't uh, have a loss in skill, but they had an emerging skill or you know, any of the other 10 <laughs> things on the list as reasons that their child will qualify for extended school year. Um, do you have any questions for me about that particular topic? I know that one's probably a little confusing. Does everyone know how to read your, your child's services section on the IEP so that you know how many minutes your child is supposed to be getting of related services? I'm pretty sure I've got two IEP meetings next week and I've been like review. Well, I only have one draft, but it mentions like she gets like 90 minutes of she's going into high school. She gets 90 mm -hmm. minutes of speech a month and um, various different accommodations. And I think 10 minutes a week of something else, but yeah, it's all kind of listed out there. I don't, is there something else I should be looking for or? No, you're looking at the, at the right minutes. Um, okay. Yeah, so she's likely got some intervention specialist minutes. Um, some, a lot of kids have speech pathology or occupational therapy. Rarely do kids have at public school have behavior analyst minutes on there, but sometimes they do. Um, unfortunately, with special education, that's a, that's about your only hope for compensatory education is getting those minutes mm -hmm. back um, that were missed. What questions overall do people have? This is this is really interesting and I appreciate it. Thank you. And I, I did write down a couple questions. So my daughter is in fourth grade. Um, we pulled her out of a brick and mortar school because her anxiety is just, it's just outrageous. So she's uh, actually in a public online charter school doing very well, getting 120 minutes of intervention uh, each week. She has a 